Well, good evening, everybody from London, and welcome to another Harif uh, Zoom event. Um, we do these regularly on a Tuesday every two weeks. And um, as most of you know by now, um, we are a small organization um, run by volunteers, and um, we are a, a charity. Um, and our mission is to raise awareness of the history and culture of Jews from the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Uh, we have a website, www.harif.org. And to receive details of our events, you have to be subscribed to the Harif website. We also have a, a news website called Point of No Return. Just click on news when you go to the Harif website. Uh, this session is being recorded. It's actually being live streamed to the Harif Facebook page. Um, and the video hopefully will be up very shortly on our Harif video channel, accessible on the website. Um, if you have any questions or observations, please do type them in the chat as uh, there are quite a few of you here tonight and uh, you won't be able to raise your hand. So tonight um, we have quite a treat. We will be discussing one of the foremost Sephardi business figures and philanthropists of the 20th century, Edmund Safra. And um, he is a um, well known to most of you, I think. And uh, I discovered, in fact, that uh, he is a, a, he was a good friend of Elton John. And Elton John says, anyone who knew my treasured friend, Edmund Safra, was keenly aware that he was a remarkable person thoughtful, welcoming, and intelligent. But it has taken until um, last year for a biography to actually be written about him. And the author of this biography is Daniel Gross. And this is the book here, A Banker's Journey. And tonight, I am absolutely delighted to be in conversation uh, with Daniel Gross about Edmund Safra. Uh, so welcome, Daniel. He's joining us from uh, Connecticut. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So my first question to you, Daniel, is uh, what motivated you to write the book? Um, uh, what motivated a, a man with a name like Gross to write <laughs> a book about Edmund Safra, who is of Lebanese and Syrian um, background? And what parallels are there between Safra's and your own family background? Well, first of all, Lynn, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you all for coming. I see there are 103 people in the room already. I scroll through, I see some uh, familiar faces as well from people who have been some of the, at, at our other events. So it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, virtually. Um, Lawrence, if you could show the first slide, please, of mm -hmm. Edmund Safra's portrait. Uh, so the question is how I got onto this story. Of course, Edmund Safra has a fascinating life story. Uh, I am a veteran business journalist. I studied business history in college and in graduate school. I worked at uh, the New Republic and Bloomberg News. I was a columnist for Newsweek and the New York Times. I covered the great story of financial globalization. I went to the World Economic Forum for several years and interviewed every leading banker and central banker. I've written eight books, including about the financial crisis, um, et cetera. So that, you know, that puts me, would have put me in a position to write a story about what Edmund Safra did with his life. He was a banker in the second half of the 20th century. But as far as who Edmund Safra was, a Halabi, a Jew from Beirut, a Sephardic Jew, um, that's a different story. And it's part of the same story. And fortunately, I am by circumstance of my birth qualified to tell that to a degree. Now, my last name is Gross. That is about as Ashkenaz as Ashkenaz can get. My father was a nice Jewish boy from the Bronx. My great grandparents on his side came from Lithuania, um, but he was an only child. 
Uh, his parents died very young, so we really had no family on that side. And my family that I knew was my mother. My mother was named Sandra Nasser. Um, she grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, her parents were Nassers and Dwecks. They each had, you know, 10, my grandparents each had 10 brothers and sisters. My great grandmother, Becky, who I knew, was born in Aleppo and carried that accent with her her whole life. And we were, while we did not live in the Brooklyn and Deal community, we were very much part of it. That's, that's what my family was. So growing up, I had a sipta. I didn't have a booby. Uh, she made kibbe when I went to see her. Um, we cursed at each other in Arabic. When they spoke, they said things they didn't want us to understand. They didn't speak Yiddish. Um, they spoke Arabic. And that's sort of the world I came from. Um, and so if you were to put together a Venn diagram, the next slide, please, Lawrence. Of people who can write sweeping narratives about 20th century global finance and people who are Syrian Jews. Next slide. It's a very small overlap. And the overlap is probably one person and that's me. Uh, that's a, a photo of a much younger me. Um, and so several years ago, I got a phone call um, and a colleague had asked me, you know, do you know who Edmund Safra is? And, you know, I thought I did. Of course, I knew about his life. I knew what he meant, uh, some of what he meant to the Syrian community. Um, and that's what I told, you know, Lily Safra when I went to see her, they told me they had this remarkable archive of his personal papers, family papers, company papers going back to the 30s in seven different languages, Hebrew, Arabic, French, Spanish, German, Italian, Spanish. Um, they had transcripts of hundreds of interviews that had been conducted in the years after his death with people who knew him from grade school in Beirut, from Brazil in the 1950s, from Switzerland in the 1960s. Um, I see at least one person on this call who was one of those people who was interviewed. Everywhere he touched down, he touched the lives of rabbis, of people who worked for him, famous bankers, people you would have never heard of from Beirut who he helped find uh, you know, their, their way in the world. And there were these transcripts of these three or 400 interviews of, as well. And so if you knew how to understand the story, what they were saying, uh, there was a great story to be told. And I, I, it was like taking a jigsaw puzzle and jumping the pieces out because there's material in, like I said, seven or eight different languages. And if you didn't know the slang and what they were talking about, you wouldn't be able to understand his life. Um, so you had to understand you know, why gold traded freely in, in Asia, but not in Europe. But you had to understand also what somebody meant when they called someone a sharmuta. You had to understand why you know, his license plate number and his phone extension was always 5555. For the Hamsa. And I just learned recently that there was a department at the bank in New York, Republic Bank, which he started from scratch, which grew to be the 11th largest bank in, in the United States. But there's a department there called, they referred to as Department 555, <laughs> where, he gave, where he gave jobs to people, you know, who didn't really necessarily have any skills or couldn't get a job somewhere else, that he put them on the payroll and he paid for that out of his own money. So his sense of personal responsibility as a Sephardic Jew, as a Lebanese Jew, and as a Jew from Aleppo informed what he did in his life, and what he did in his profession. And so um, in some ways, I guess I was uniquely situated to be able to tell this story. Right, and so why, why has he been described as the greatest banker of his generation? Can I have the next uh, slide, please? You know, having covered banking uh, through the global financial crisis, it's hard to think of even like one pretty good banker from the last generation. Um, when you look at Edmund Safra's life, what did he do? He inherited his father's tiny bank in Beirut. He kept it running through the occupation, through the civil war. He owned it at the time of his death. He went to Switzerland and started a private bank, Trade Development Bank, which many people in New England and England know founded in 1959, went public in 1972, that sold in 1982 for more than $500 million. Next slide, please. He knew, this is a very poor picture, it's him and David Rockefeller. He knew bankers at every level of the world personally. He founded Republic Bank in New York in 1965 as a startup. It grew to be the 11th largest bank in the United States. In 1988, he started Safra Republic Bank, 
a Swiss private bank. It grew to be a very large bank. Um, in Brazil, he set up financial institutions that his brothers took over that they grew into one of the largest financial institutions in Brazil. So he founded four banks on three different continents. The, the stocks were publicly held. They got like a 20, 25% compounded return. He never took a bailout. He almost never made a bad loan. Uh, so that combination of you know, an entrepreneurship with a conservatism that provided financing and jobs and uh, security to so many people, to my mind, that makes him one of the greatest bankers of the 20th century. So he died mysteriously in Monaco in 1999. I think a lot of people will, will know about that, but, um, but we never really heard of uh, an explanation uh, for his death. And he, he wasn't very old, was he, at the time? Yeah, you, want to, you can either take the, the slide down or, or move to the next one. Um, so what I said is that a lot of people know, uh, what a lot of people know about Edmund Safra was how he was attacked. There was this crazy episode in the late 80s where American Express ran this smear campaign against him. And that was documented in a book called Vendetta, which is 500 pages about uh, sort of one year in his life. So they know how he was attacked. And they know how he died. He died in a fire in 1999 that was set by one of his male nurses. This was written about in the tabloids in Vanity Fair by Dominic Dunn. Uh, there are a host of conspiracy theories surrounding it. Um, in the book, and of course in the final chapter, I do talk about this at length with um, many explicit you know, quotations and, and sightings of the testimony, the police investigations. I mean, the upshot was in his mid 60s, he got he came down with Parkinson's disease. His mobility was severely restricted. He had round the clock medical care. Um, he was living, he was in Monaco. Um, his, uh, he had a male nurse, it was a former US uh, Marine who was uh, mentally unstable, who decided that he would try to solidify his place in the household by staging an attack and fending it off. And he basically um, on the morning of Edmund's death, stabbed himself in the in the stomach, sandpapered his face, and set a, a fire in a wastebasket to alert the first responders and said, there's been an attack. Um, and the Saffir, upon hearing this, goes into a essentially a closet, locks himself in because he thinks there's an intruder. And there's a series of you know, poor response by the Monaco police and fire. Uh, they don't let his own security up there. And he eventually died of asphyxiation or suffocation uh, from the smoke from the fire. Um, that is the story. I will talk about that in, in the final chapter of the book. Right. So let's talk about his family background. Uh, I mean, what kind of childhood do you, would you say he had? So <clears throat> and the Safra was, uh, the Safras were a family from Aleppo. You know, when I'm in person, I can always ask, you know, how many people in this room uh, were born in Halab? How many people here can trace their ancestry? And it's harder to do that in a Zoom environment, but I've done several where you know there are still people with us who were born in Aleppo. Aleppo was, of course, a legendary city in Jewish history, a continuous Jewish presence since the time of the Bible. It's referred to in the Bible as Aram Tsova. The great synagogue there has a uh, cornerstone that dates to the third century, a thriving uh, Jewish community. Aleppo was the third largest city in the Ottoman Empire. And in the 1870s, 1860s, we first start seeing on paper Safra Frere, the Safra brothers emerge on paper. They are bankers, but without really a bank, they're money changers, they're, they, they give credit. And there were four brothers. Um, one went to Alexandria, one went to Istanbul, one went to Beirut, one stayed in Aleppo. It was like a mini Rothschilds of the Middle East because the Ottoman Empire was a kind of integrated whole where you could work and do business. Um, one of the four brothers was uh, Edna Safra's grandfather, Eli, who died young, and his son Jacob was brought into the fold um, by the, his uncles. Uh, Jacob went to Beirut, comes back to Aleppo in 1914 after, you know, after World War I. The Ottoman Empire is no more. It doesn't make sense to have these connections anymore. The, the Safra Freire disband, and Jacob Safra decides to go back to Beirut, which is looking like a much more optimistic, um, ambitious place after World War I, and he starts his own bank there in 1920. Edmund Safra was born in Beirut in 1932. Can we have the next uh, slide, please? 
So this is a photo of uh, Jacob Safra in the middle, Edmund's mother Esther, Tara Safra. Uh, Jacob and Esther were uh, cousins. It was fairly common at that time for people to marry within the family. And these are six of the nine children they had with Edmund uh, on the far, as you're looking at it, on the far left. Right, well, he, he seems to have been quite mischievous at school. Can you give me an example of what he got up to? So, you know, the Safras were a sort of a privileged family, right? They were one of the, there were sort of two Jewish banks in Beirut. There's the Safras and the Zilchas. There were a couple other financial institutions run by Jews as well. Um, they went to the Allianz school. I'm wondering if there are any people on the call who might have gone to an Allianz school. These were the French speaking schools from Morocco to uh, Iran uh, that were you know, aimed at Jewish students, but giving them a secular education as well as a Jewish education. And he was quite a poor student. Um, he would, you know, in the interviews, I found people who talked about, you know, one who had to help him with his math. Uh, a, a, there was a formidable teacher, Madame Tarab, who famously said, you know, Edmund, if you don't work hard, you're, you're gonna end up shining shoes. Um, 30 years later, she shows up at one of his banks to check on an account and he walks in and says, you know, are you ready for your shoe shine now? Um, <laughs> at the age of 10 or 11, they, he was doing poorly in school and his father sent him to a boarding school called uh, St. Joseph at Antura, which was a place where kind of Christian, Muslim and Jewish elites went. And he, he went there for a couple of years. And of course his schooling ended at the age of 15. Um, that was so, about as far as, as it went. So can you tell us what happened when he, when he turned 15? I mean, isn't this when he left home and why yes, so, was he sent away? So if you do the math, 19, he was born in 1932, he turned 15 in 1947. And you think about what's happening in the Middle East at that time, um, Israel is about to be formed. There's all the convulsions happening uh, as a result of the end of World War II. Jacob Safra decides that he needs a beachhead for the family somewhere outside of Beirut, somewhere outside of Syria. Um, there were four sons. Obviously the sons tend to go into the business and he had an older brother named Ellie who was eight or nine years older, who was already working. But Jacob had identified in his second son, even though he was 14 or 15, that, this, that he would be the one to carry the business forward. Um, Edmund had been working you know, as an apprentice coming to the office since the age of 10 or 11. People recognize a certain native intelligence in him. And Jacob Safra decides that um, he's going to send Edmund to Milan. He had commercial connections there. There were a handful of other uh, Syrian Jews there. Um, he's going to send him to Milan and he's going to start you know, trading. Edmund at the time is 15, but he doesn't send him alone. He sends him with a chaperone, a guy named Jacques Tawel, who was 19 years old. Um, and the two of them drive in the fall of 1947 from Beirut to Lod, you know, which is now Tel Aviv and get on a plane from, from what was then Palestine uh, to Rome and take a bus to Milan. And he sets up shop there and there he, he embarks on his career. Can I have the next slide, please, Lawrence? Oh, that's just a, a promissory note from uh, 1927. And when I refer to being able to, you know, like a puzzle, this is a, a promissory note from Jacob Saffer's bank in 1927. And of course you have sort of Arabic and, and French writing there. Uh, the next slide, please. And this one more of uh, Beirut in the 50s. The, the man with the tarbush is Jacob Safra. The man in the middle is the chief rabbi of Beirut. The man on the left is Pierre Jamal. Sort of indication of how they were integrated into the establishment. Yeah. Uh, the next, please. All right, so this is Edmund Safra in Europe. At the time of this photo, he was probably in his teens. He always looked much older than his years, and he was always able to sort of function in adult society, even as a teenager. And, you know, when he gets to Milan, um, the main thing he was doing was looking for gold. Gold did not trade freely in Europe. This was the Bretton Woods era. It was pegged at $35 an ounce, but it traded freely in Kuwait, in India, and Hong Kong. And the Safras knew how to move gold throughout the world. So Edmund would go to Zurich, he went to Amsterdam, he went to Paris, and he would buy gold, he would buy gold coins, send them to his father, and they would move them to the to points east. Um, he had an older brother, his older sister, Evelyn, was married to a man named Rachmo Nasser, who had been a surgeon in Aleppo. 
Um, he had to leave there after the riots in 47. They send Rachbo Nasser to Hong Kong. So you set up shop there, we will send you gold and you can sell it into the local market because it commanded a much higher price. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, he was also financing films. This is a, a, a receipt from a, um, a film called La Fille de Regiment, the, the Daughter of the Regiment. It's based on an opera. He was uh, financing films that Earl Flynn was making. Earl Flynn was making a, a big, uh, trying to make a comeback, making a film, a version of William Tell. Um, Edmund financed that at the age of 18 or 19. So he was circulating throughout Europe, speaking three or four different languages, trading gold, doing foreign currency exchange and getting involved in different types of financing activities at the age when most people were, you know, still in college or still in high school. And how successful was his uh, financing of films? I mean, did they make money? Uh, he did quite poorly in the films, but fortunately in the banking, he did pretty well. So he then and it should be noted that his yeah. um, one of his nephews, who is named Jackie Safra, um, became a film producer much later in life and financed a lot of uh, Woody Allen's movies. Fascinating. So, so then from Milan, he moves where to? To Brazil? Yeah. So in 1952, um, there's a uh, the, the Safra family's apartment in Beirut is ransacked. Things are getting a little, you know, Beirut, Lebanon was the only Arab country where the Jewish population increased after the formation of Israel. A lot of people from Syria came there and it was kind of stable, but there was also this air of tension and instability. Uh, and Jacobs says, you know, we need to, we need to get out of Beirut. Uh, we need to find a safer place. Uh, the US where of course there were a lot of Syrians would not sort of take immigrants, even immigrants with money. You couldn't just show up in Europe and get citizenship. And um, a handful of Syrian Jews had found their way to Colombia and Argentina and Brazil. And at the age of 20, 21, Edmund decides we're moving the family and our future businesses to Brazil. So they, he arranges for his younger brother, uh, Joseph, to go to boarding school um, at Whittingham College. I'm wondering if any people on the call are familiar with that. It's a uh, boarding school, I think near Brighton, where a lot of Sephardic Jews uh, went in the 50s and 60s. Um, his sisters, a couple of them get married. His other younger brother, Moise, who's already of working age, they take, they go with their father, Jacob, who's starting to suffer from illnesses. And then 1954, they moved to Brazil and say, we're setting up shop here. Mm -hmm. So uh, what role did Judaism play in his life? And what uh, uh, role did superstition play? Well, you mentioned the Hamsa, the 555. Uh, Play the, can I the next slide, please? Yes, Mo Monica's brother went to Whittingham College. I saw that, it was wonderful. Uh, the next one? Um, that, that is his uh, Brazilian uh, passport, which he got, and you see at the top, it says Comerciante is his profession, which is trader, not a banker. As a, as a non-citizen, he wasn't allowed to have a bank. So he set up, when he got to Brazil, a series of import-export trade operations. Um, and at the time, then he went back to Switzerland in the late 50s and started um, Trade Development Bank. Okay, the next slide, please. Keep going. Do a few more, but we'll come back to these um, in a bit. And I wanted to get to the Judaism stuff. Yeah. Here we are. So a lot of people, when I looked at the interviews, talked about Edmund Safra's superstitions and strange beliefs. And I think this is another example of people not understanding because for a Syrian Jew or a, a man or a woman from Aleppo, it's not superstition, it's simply your custom. And our customs are just as natural to us as the customs of people from Poland and Russia are to them. Uh, Judaism was integral to his life. This is a photo of a groundbreaking for his skyscraper that he was building as Republic Bank's headquarters, where he has not one, but two rabbis. He was incredibly deferential to rabbis. Next, please. Um, this is a photo of him. He, again, I spoke with his assistant. He put on tefillin every morning at the office. 
he carried in his pockets um, amulets, signs, you know, things of, again, of, of uh, things to ward off the evil eye. He would frequently make, say, Hamsa and make the sign of the Hamsa. He believed it was bad luck not to give money uh, to rabbis. And I said he, you know, that he had 5555 on his license plate. He would try to do a deal on the 18th of the month. He would try to do deals on Tuesdays, if everybody knows, in um, Genesis. On the third day, God says, and you know, he saw that it was good twice. So people think that Tuesday is a particularly auspicious day. So these things like were natural to him, but they would strike outsiders as a very strange way of doing business. Can I have the next one, please? Um, he, <clears throat> in Lebanon, in Beirut and in Aleppo, there were these formal community councils that would collect money and support all the different charitable organizations. And when the communities were exiled, and those councils sort of broke up, Edmund Safra kind of took it upon himself to be a one person community council. And so I found in the archives, folders and folders of documents going back to the 50s and 60s of synagogues. The Sephardic synagogue in Milan needs new prayer books, he gives them. Um, somebody needs money, he gives. Anywhere Jews were gathering in Brazil, in Argentina, in Brooklyn, a group of Egyptian Jews gathering in uh, Brooklyn to start a new synagogue. They came to him and he said, you know, you need this much money, I'll guarantee the loan. Or I'll give you the loan without principal. Or you raise what you raise and I'll write the rest. Um, can I have the next one? And there's the story of, of how he helped uh, smuggle Torah scrolls out of Lebanon. Can you tell us uh, a bit more about yeah. that? Sure, I will tell you that in a minute. But this yeah. is a, okay. a letter from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson in 1971, you see it's addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Ezra Safra. Of course, his name was Edmund, but his Hebrew name uh, was Ezra. And it was on the occasion of, he had given not one, but two Torahs to Sha'are Tzion, which is one of the big Syrian synagogues in Brooklyn. And it's a whole uh, sort of midrash by the Rebbe of, you know, why it's such an honor and why it's so great to give um, two rather than one. And you can see that he signed it in person and, and made an edit. Um, the story goes, uh, can I have the next one? Uh, this is a letter from the early 60s. You know, at the time <clears throat> when the still had the bank in Brazil and the Arab countries were blacklisting people who did business with Israel, um, he made a, a point of not sort of investing in Israel and not corresponding directly with people in Israel. Uh, so this is a letter from uh, Edmund's associate Jacques Dweck to Isaac Shalom, who was like the leader of the Syrian Jewish community. And he's sort of sending him money uh, for uh, funds for Parat Yosef, which is the big Sephardic uh, yeshiva in the uh, old city of Jerusalem. But he didn't want to send the money directly. He worked through third parties. And the next one, please. Uh, this is a, one of my sort of favorite letters that I found. I'm sure many of the people on the call are able to read French. Um, it's written from Aleppo in 1979, and it's signed Le Rabbin de Alep, the rabbis of Aleppo. These are the, the last sort of group of seven or eight rabbis who were hanging on, and Edmund was almost single-handedly keeping this community afloat. Uh, the letter it talks about how the chief rabbi, Yom Tov Yadid, was ill. He was suffering financially, um, and could you, you know, our, our great benefactor of, of great heart and generosity, can you help us? And you see at the top in green pen, it says $7,500. Um, at one of my uh, first, at the book launch, uh, the woman who was Edmund's um, personal assistant for many years was there. She came up to me at the end and said, that's my handwriting. So part of the day would be, you know, reviewing correspondence and he telling her how much to give. Uh, so he was really a, a great aid to the remaining Syrian uh, community in Syria and also in Beirut. And yes, at one point they did smuggle the remaining um, uh, uh, Torah scrolls that were in Beirut out of uh, out of the out of the country, uh, like surreptitiously in pieces. And I, I guess I would be remiss in saying that his 
the sort of greatest single thing he did um, for the Syrian Jews is in 1994, there were still 4,000 Jews left in uh, Aleppo and Damascus. Assad was holding them hostage. Um, there was a sort of break after the Gulf War where they were, Assad was talking to Israel a little bit and trying to get money from the West. And they were putting pressure on him to, you know, let, let the last Jews go. And Assad finally relented, but his conceit was, you know, I don't want people to think they can just leave Syria. They all have to buy round trip tickets. We'll tell people they're coming back. Um, and someone picked up the phone and they called Edmund Safra and said, we need 4,000 round trip tickets. And he paid for it on the spot. Um, and that was essentially when those people left, that was essentially the end of organized uh, Jewish presence in Syria. Right, and did he help resettle them in Brooklyn or Deal? Uh, yes, uh, and there's actually an interesting story, and I think some people on the call may appreciate this as well. You know, there's a fair amount of, I don't know if it's chauvinism, discrimination, um, but certainly in the US where Sephardic Jews are a very tiny, tiny sliver of the population that not always looked after by the larger institutions. And someone went to the UJA and said, you know, we have 4,000 Jews coming here. We need $20 million to settle them. And they said, well, you know, we don't really have money for that. Um, Edmund picked up the phone and said, called the guy at the UJA and said, what about the 10 million I gave you three months ago? Um, and they, they did agree to help, so yes. Um, there's also, again, evidence and doc that I refer to a lot, that was sort of a wholesale basis. Throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s, as people were leaving Beirut, they would write him and say, should I go to Argentina? Should I go to Brazil? I've showed up in Canada, what should I do? And he would tell people, you know, show up at the bank, go see my brother, go see this guy, I'll give you a job. Fantastic. Well, what about his private life? Because he, he remained a, a bachelor for a long, long time, which is probably contrary to, <laughs> to, to what was usual in those communities. So he seemed a confirmed bachelor married to the bank. Um, why did he fall for, Liv for Lily? Yeah, can I have the next slide, please? So you're shrewd to note, you know, Edmund Safra adhered to tradition and the norms of his communities um, in many ways. The one area in which he departed was uh, to a degree in his personal life. It was typical for people of his era. If you were a Syrian man at the age of 29, you would marry an 18 or 19 year old woman and have five or six children. Um, Edmund was, I don't wanna say it was a nomadic life, but he, it was like rotating between these poles. If you look at his life when he was in his 20s and 30s, he was in Beirut for a month and then Brazil for a month, and then New York for two months, and then Paris, and then Geneva, and then in the south of France in the summer, and then in London, um, doing business. You know, For him, personal life and business life were one and the same. So he was not the sort of person to settle down. He didn't feel like that was a sort of appropriate setting for a family to have a you know, father who would be all over the place. Um, I think he liked being single. So while his brothers and siblings all married at the age they were supposed to, um, he did not. And, um, you know, he met uh, Lily Safra while he was, I'm sorry, Lily, they met, uh, let's see, 1969. So he was in his late thirties. They got married in 1976. Um, Lily, of course, was from Brazil. She was Ashkenazi. She had been married uh, before and had her own children uh, from a previous marriage. Um, and it was clear they were you know, not gonna have their own biological children. And so there was a certain amount of um, sort of concern or trepidation on the part of his family who felt, you know, you need to have your own children because that's, that's, that's our business. That's who's gonna take over the next generation of the business. Um, and I would say that is the sort of area where he diverged from the, the custom and tradition, but they had a, you know, they became sort of partners in a uh, true sense of the word. She obviously, she had her, she was a wealthy woman in her own right before they got married. Um, they collected, you know, fine art, fine objects. She was a, a, known as a, an entertainer. Um, and one of the great events, you know, 
uh, Republic Bank would put on a, a reception at the IMF annual meeting every year for 3,000 people where all the clients from around the world would come and she would plan that um, in intricate detail. So it was a, in some ways also a non-traditional uh, marriage in the way that she was involved with his activities. So who inherited the business? Um, I mean, they obviously both died. Um, did, did the business, is the business being run by the stepchildren? So the, you know, it, the story of this book and the life, it, on the one hand, it's a story of triumph, success, entrepreneurship. And in a typical American business story, you know, starting a business, an immigrant coming in, building a global business, and then selling it for $10 billion would be, like, that's the apex of success. That's the whole thing. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, that's another photo. Uh, the next one, please. One more. Okay. So in the late 1990s, in the 1990s, as I said, in the uh, Edmund is uh, afflicted with Parkinson's disease and is less able to keep up his, you know, 24 seven uh, work, travel, et cetera. Um, his banks were publicly held. He had two banks at the time, Republic and Saffir Republic Holdings, which was the private bank in Switzerland. He personally owned 30% of each of those. <laughs> his brothers, Joseph and Moise were running their bank in Brazil which itself was a very large entity. Edmund was never very good about grooming a successor. He had CEOs because at Republic, he was the chairman because he didn't live in the US, but it was clear who was making the decisions. Um, and so the questions were raised. There was never any succession plan. There was never any talk of executive development about who would take over if he wasn't there. People sort of assumed it would be someone else in the family. Um, so in the late 1990s, Edmund Dezil, he, he was trying to work out with his brothers how they might figure out a, a way to go forward so that, you know, they help his brother Joseph, you know, could he run the bank? They pool their ownership in some way. How would they figure out how to go to the next generations? Because his two brothers had, had sons of their own who would come into the business and were already starting to do so. And they, they couldn't figure out an array. They couldn't figure out a thing, an arrangement that worked. And so Edmonds, with his health deteriorating, he decides in 1999 that the way to sort of protect his depositors, um, his employees, is to sell the banks. And he decides to sell them HSBC, which of course traces its origins to a bank founded in Hong Kong uh, by Jews from Iraq, um, decides to buy it for $10 billion in cash. That's the largest price paid in cash uh, for a bank in the US to that date. You'll see the transaction, $72 a share. What might the significance of $72 be? It's um, superstition again. Was it gematria? <laughs> no, it's four, four times high. I don't know if that was the, the reason, but it is four times 18. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, $10 right. million, he's gonna, he's gonna walk away with $3 million. It should be a moment of triumph. And a friend comes from Geneva uh, to congratulate him. And she says, Mabrouk, you know, look what you've done. And he looks at her and says, J'ai vendu mes enfants. I've sold my children. I've sold my babies. And so this moment that would have been a triumph for any other business person or entrepreneur was a moment for him of sadness. Um, so that's what happened. So the two banks, they were sold to HSBC. He um, took the money. He was going to start another financial institution. Uh, this time he was gonna name it after himself, Edmund Safra Asset Management. It was gonna be a, you know, a private bank where it would manage his money. And he had a deal with HSBC that he could take on more clients up to $5 billion. And on the day of his death, they, they were signing the papers to go forward on that. So even though he was ill, even though he was 67, even though he had done all this, he was gonna continue on in the banking business. Wow, what a story. So you've put all this in, in, in a book, uh, Daniel, which is here. Um, highly recommended. How do people get hold of it? So the, the best place to buy it is on Amazon. Um, I know it's at Waterstones. Um, 
Obviously, it's available, the audio version. There's an audio book that's uh, out now. Uh, we've just sold the uh, Portuguese rights, so a version in Portuguese in Brazil will be coming out later this year. But I think that, in general, the best place to purchase it is uh, on Amazon. Right. Yes, the recording should be up tonight if we can get our act together. And it'll be on the Harif website. Just click on videos. So um, there are people on the call who knew uh, Edmund Safra. And so you're welcome, please, to um, type in your comments on the chat and share your memories if you have them. I know uh, Nina Wiener. Uh, said that her husband Walter worked for Edmund Safra for over 40 years and thanks to Edmund and Lily Safra he was able to co-found in 1977 ISEF, the International Safadi Foundation that made Edmund and Lily very proud of the results of our Israeli alumni who were able to be the first generation to go to college. Uh, Daniel, can you say something about his philanthropy in Israel. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, hello to Nina. We, we met in Jerusalem um, at the event we had at the Israel Museum. It's good to see you again here. <clears throat> so ISEF, uh, and Nina, I think, is being modest because if you read the book, um, it was, you know, she was one of the people who helped instigate its founding. In the 70s, um, Sephardic kids in, in Israel were very much outside the mainstream. Maybe 2% were going to college. And when she suggested they do something, and he said, well, we should do something, and they founded ISEF. It is a foundation that gives, um, that to this day, the, the Safra Foundation, which is the foundation Edmund left behind, supports about 25% of their operations, and they give uh, scholarships to about 150 kids a year. They're do in medical school. They're pursuing postdoctorate. They're uh, undergrads. And I had the privilege when I was in Israel in November um, at Tel Aviv University, the current group of uh, ISEF fellows, about 150 of these students, they came to Tel Aviv and I was able to talk to them. Um, I have a picture, I, I didn't have it in this slide deck, but when you see the photo, it's, um, you know, it's kids from, uh, whose parents were from Iraq, from Syria, from Iran, from Ethiopia, um, every color, every shape, the sort of modern Israel and all its uh, beauty. Um, and these kids who are all kind of first generation uh, making their way in the world because the, you know, the talent is certainly uh, there. It's just the opportunities have not been distributed. And I think Edmund in his lifetime was a champion of uh, Sephardic Jews, not just from Syria and Lebanon, but from Egypt and Morocco and Iran and Iraq in Israel, in the communities where they were. And his foundation has continued to, you know, look off after and, and sort of promote their future. Right. And uh, actually, as somebody has pointed out, Lily Safra sadly passed away last June. I don't That's know right. She um, was. Yeah. <laughs> she was, I believe, 87 or 88. I, I did meet her and interview her several times uh, for this book. Right. And uh, I think we have two people who actually uh, met Edmond Alon Fahi um, and um, Nicole. Sorry, just um, like Monk. Yes, Nicole Monk. Uh, yeah, it's you know, I, I don't know. Are you able to unmute people? Because I, I do a whole thing. Uh, I've given probably 20 talks so far. And some of them, you know, at your typical suburban Ashkenaz synagogue in the US, I will stand up and say, you know, how many people here know who Edmund Safra was? How many people here <laughs> met him? I'm going to have to take out the meeting. Everyone who is called iPhone or iPad or names like that, just <laughs> we don't want. So if you haven't put a name, put it in quickly, because you'll be taken out the meeting. In, <laughs> okay. I'll put you in the waiting room. If you change your name in the waiting yeah. room, I will then switch it back. Do you want to ask uh, Alain to... I'm not going to ask him to unmute till I've got all the things sorted, darling. <laughs> all right. Okay. Sorry, this is housekeeping. Uh, no. <laughs> we, we want to avoid anyone um, yeah. sort of no from the meeting. Obviously, because we don't have registration. So I'm putting anyone yeah. with, with names who we don't know into the waiting room. If you put a proper name there, I will bring you back in the yeah. meeting. 
but uh, I'm sure we'll be able to uh, unmute perhaps Adam Farhi. Yeah, but yeah. so I, yeah. as I was, as I was yeah. saying, I, I go through a whole thing. I say, how many people here know who Edmund Saffer was? Raise your hand. How yeah. many people here, you know, met him? How many people here worked at one of his banks? How many people here knew him in Beirut? You know, so again, at a typical Ashkenaz synagogue, and you, no one will raise, people like have no idea. Yes. But I've also done, I did a presentation. We had a book launch in Brooklyn with 500 people. And when I said, how many people here knew him in Beirut? There were literally 15 or 20 people who had, you know, been to school with him in the Galeon. So it really depends on the audience. Um, and I can see in the comments here, there are several people who worked for um, Republic Bank. Um, I, Someone saying that his step uh, Edmund step right Edmund stepmother Marie Marie Dweck uh, is the Jack Sasson's mother's cousin. I mean that's sort of the way things are in this community that there's a a connection uh, among people that even though that's so widely dispersed. And I guess I would yes invite if we're able to unmute people. There are people yeah, on the call who is unmuted. Um, Alan. Uh, yeah, and most Hello, of everybody. Hello, everybody. I hope you can all hear me and, and yes, see me. Yes, can, loud and clear. Okay. I uh, graduated from NYU with an MBA in uh, October 71. And uh, the first thing I thought, because uh, the head of personnel at r and was a classmate of my father in Egypt, I applied for a job. Uh, immediately, when Edmund saw my name was Farhi, uh, he gave instruction to hire me. Uh, I don't think I had uh, to pass an interview. That was his normal uh, generosity of uh, hiring uh, Sephardic Jew from uh, to his bank. And I worked there. When the bank started, we were about uh, 300 people. And uh, I did a lot of uh, assignment uh, for him. Uh, one of them was in London at the Republic of New York. I filled in uh, because the manager was uh, on vacation. And at one time I had an off I shared an office next to his on the eighth floor at Republic National Bank. Uh, he lived on the uh, floor above and he had an apartment and a restaurant. As a matter of fact, I still have one of the ashtray that... <laughs> I got there is. as an employee, okay? <laughs> they used to have uh, a lot of uh, calendar, okay? Republic National Bank calendar, which were the most beautiful leather calendar that I uh, kept uh, using for years and years. A long story is that Edmund, first of all, all the names that uh, are mentioned in uh, Lily Safra, the Gilded Lily, a name that I recognized because uh, he was receiving calls from all these people in Brazil and uh, all over the world. And uh, it's like a second family, all these names, I knew them all. I also worked for Cyril Dweck for a while uh, and uh, Shua Yedid, uh, may he rest, both rest in peace. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, he used to call me, I was at the gold desk every day to ask what the price of gold was because uh, we, were, we were dealing in gold. And this is how I got involved in gold and carried it for maybe 20 years or 30 years later uh, for different people, but not Republic. Uh, the interesting thing is I want to say is that he always accompanied his guest to the elevator. <laughs> and if the guy was very important, he took them down all the way to their car. And uh, it is something I kept doing when I started my own business is always to take the people to the elevator. And I once shared it with the head of one of the company that was representing a British guy in London. And he said that this is something he has been doing ever since. Take the guest to the, uh, to the elevator all the way down. Uh, I want to mention, I, uh, I was working with uh, Jackie Safra on the same uh, trading floor. And I saw him many, many times in uh, Lausanne and, uh, and sometime in New York. And he had a role in a movie called Radio Day of Woody Allen. He's the <laughs> guy 
who is trying to pronounce properly uh, a certain word. I did not know at the time that he was financing all this uh, movie. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I left the bank in 74. And uh, later, I used to meet him at the uh, synagogue on Madison Avenue and uh, the 70th, there was a, a Westbury hotel. He used to rent a room and that was a, a Sephardic synagogue for all the people in Manhattan. Uh, and he was very generous by bidding for all the uh, aliot and uh, honors and giving them out, not for himself, but all the people, his friends in the room. Later after he passed away or even before, I got to know a lot of his earlier partner in Beirut and uh, in Africa or even in Geneva and London. So uh, I was very close to that whole gang of the Safra environment. And I have to say that I had bought shares in the Republic when they first went public and sold them when uh, uh, Midland Bank, Hong Kong uh, and Shanghai Bank bought it back. I wish I kept them because I would have been even more, <laughs> but uh, it was a cash offer only. There you go. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Um, oh, actually, there, well, there let me mention comment. one thing before. Let, one, one thing before. Edmund Safford genealogy is on the website, farhi.org. Right. Yes. Far By the way, I don't have, I don't have uh, a Sandra Nasser on it. So uh, Daniel, maybe you want to fill in the gaps. Okay. I'll get your email later. Um, there, uh, well, yep. there's a comment just now from someone saying uh, David told that his uncle, the, the, uh, my uncle Jacques Towel, I mentioned him that he was Edmund Chaperone, who was, you know, 19 when Edmund, you know, said they needed a grown up to take Edmund to Milan. Um, yep. That David is, is uh, Jacques' nephew. Uh, David, are you on the, would you like to join us and, and tell us a little bit about your? Any memories you have of your, your uncle and, and Edmund Safra? Who's that? Yeah, so that's David Tawil. David Tawil. Right. right. Yeah, and at least two other people worked for yeah, Safra. We've got Liz we've Kay got and Liz Kay. Simon Monk. And Simon Monk, yeah. And Simon has a, a nice story. Um, so I'm going to get down a list. Sorry, so. there are so many names to go through. <laughs> David, do you want to, David Tawil, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my, my uncle Jacques uh, uh, came to Europe uh, with, with Edmond and uh, they, they were in business together and, and setting up all the bank and, and the trading. Um, and my, my dad always has, has a story that, uh, you know, when he came to, to Switzerland um, and, and he met uh, with, with uh, Edmond and Jacques, uh, Edmar asked him, so where do you want to live, New York or London? And my dad said London, so he sent him to, to London to, to set up the bank here. <laughs> Wonderful. And David, where, you're, you're, was your father born in Aleppo or Beirut? He was born in Beirut, uh, but his mother was from Aleppo. Uh, his father was uh, Tawil, but from Jerusalem, actually. Okay. Uh, and went to Aleppo, married uh, my grandmother, and then had a family in, in Lebanon. And the, the families were very close. Similar background, similar, similar family story from Aleppo to, uh, to, to Lebanon and then to Europe. Wonderful, thank you. And I think Simon Monk has a good story. Can we hear? Yeah, I've got a lovely story actually. I was working uh, in the Republic of London with uh, David's father Moise and Liz Kay for a period, we were all together. But my abiding story of Edmund Safra is that I'm sitting at my desk one day as a young banker and the phone goes, I pick up the phone. There's a very quiet voice on the phone because he always used to speak very softly, at least to, at least to, maybe to, to me. And uh, he picked up the phone and said, Mr. Monk, and I, and I twigged suddenly who it was and sat bolt upright in my chair. Uh, yes, Mr. Safra. He said, I understand Mr. X, who was, let's just say, was a very, very well-known property developer in, the, in that period of time. I said, I understand Mr. X is asking for a 20 million uh, pound loan. So uh, I, I, I said, uh, yes, that's correct, Mr. Safra. There's silence on the line. I'm sitting there bolt upright, shaking. And he says, give him the money. That, that, was, the, that was the days before credit committees and analysis. Uh, he, he knew the person, person. He said, give him the money. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Safra. 
I called the client about 10 seconds later. I said, the, the loan's approved. So business was, uh, banking was a much, uh, much easier, more enjoyable in those days. <laughs> That's lovely. You know, it's, 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 because the, you know, the, the business story, it's very much of him taking these kind of old world methods that he learned in Beirut and that were honed in Aleppo, but applying them on a global scale. So of course, in, in Beirut or Aleppo, you only lent money to people you knew. There was no such thing as someone showing up and lending. You, know, you didn't lend to strangers. You didn't, you didn't advertise to give credit out. And he believed that you assessed uh, credit worthiness by looking people in their eye. And the number of stories of people who have, since the book was published, who came and said, you know, I, I had an account at Republic. I had a credit line of a million dollars, you know, which is sort of nothing in that world, that they would go to the bank that they were told Edmund wanted to, to meet them. This was a, you know, a $50 billion in assets, but he wanted to meet the person who was borrowing a million dollars because he wanted to look them in the eye. And he believed that's how you assess their credit worthiness. Um, it was also a world where, you know, you paid back your debt as a matter of honor. And it was the honor of your family name that you paid it back. And if you, you know, you, you borrowed money, and didn't pay, then you wouldn't get uh, more credit. And, you know, at some level, he really didn't like to lend money to individuals or even to companies. And his business model for many years, he would he loved to take deposits, go and get as many deposits as he could. But instead of making mortgages or credit card loans or auto loans, he would, because uh, he had this network, he would lend $50 million to the Central Bank of the Philippines, government of South Africa, government agencies in Brazil. You know, at the, at the time, the 50s, 60s, 70s, Governments never defaulted. Um, he would make loans that were guaranteed by the Export Import Bank or the World Bank. Um, they might get a lower interest rate, but he didn't have to worry about repayment. And that was his philosophy of lending. And so when you look at their quarterly reports, as companies were public, they filed quarterly reports with the SEC, uh, they had very low uh, loss reserves and they almost never took a credit loss. You know, for the chases and city groups and, uh, you know, God help us, RBSs of the world, it was very common. You write off three, five percent of your loans every year as bad debt. The Republic had almost zero credit uh, write offs. And because of that, you know, the way they made money was by doing trade finance, by doing factoring, other by trading gold, foreign currency, by moving banknotes around the world, a lot of these types of businesses that other banks weren't interested in. And there was always sort of a level of suspicion or lack of understanding that people couldn't understand how are these banks making money when they're not making loans in these volumes and they're not taking any credit losses. Okay. Um, Andre. Andre, would you like to say something? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, perfectly. Yes, uh, I want to, to tell you something that happened in Montreal. Anyway, uh, Lynn, I'm Albert's cousin, oh, Lisa's okay. husband, yeah, okay. in Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, a uh, long time ago when he came once to Montreal, uh, he, he had a teacher, Madame Tarab in, at the Alliance in Lebanon. So his teacher asked to see him and uh, of course he let her in and she said to him, I'm working for a Jewish school here and I would like a check from you for this school. So he wrote her a check. She had a look at it. She tore it and she said, Edmond, tu peux faire mieux. You can do better <laughs> than that. So then he wrote her, uh, of course, a better check and uh, she took it. So this is to show you uh, how, I mean, he, he respected his teachers and everybody loved him. Yeah. Oh, okay. wonderful story. Lovely. We got yeah. And Andre, that, that Madame Tarab was the same one who had sort of told him that he wasn't going to amount to anything when he was a student. Um, and again, at our event in Brooklyn, I think a woman who was his niece, uh, you know, told a similar story. I also see, again, looking through the comments that someone had to lift that, um, Man named Donald Zilka. The other one of the other main Jewish banks in uh, Beirut was the Zilka Bank. They had come originally from from Iraq, from Baghdad, um, and uh, well, so he had to leave the meeting. But they were the the sort of two uh, sort of main Jewish banks in Beirut in the twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties. Right now, I know 
Uh, M. Tawil wants to speak. Hold on. Right. Okay. Do you want to um, do you want to start your video and unmute yourself, um, Moise? N. N. Tawil. Yes, I, I didn't spot that for him. Okay, Moise, do, do you want to unmute yourself and start your video, please? On your desktop, you're going to have a, a, a button which says unmute and a, a button which says start video. If you can tap both of those, uh, Moise, or could David help him, guide him? Yeah, and just to say that Lisette Stalbo met uh, Lily and Edmond uh, and uh, her cousin who still lived in Beirut and um, Joseph Hakim Dweck knew him well in Beirut. So obviously he went back and forth to Lebanon until it became unsafe uh, for him to do so, Daniel. Indeed, uh, so again, the, the, the documents to, to me were a real treasure trove and we all have this image of Beirut now because what we know from the civil war in the seventies. Um, yeah, he was there constantly going back through the fifties, the sixties, even into the early seventies. And of course there were um, Jews remained in, in Beirut even to until the early eighties. Um, I also see another, speaking of Jewish banking families, uh, Lizette has posted that, um, Yes, there was a third, the De Pachotos, uh, people know that name. Now they were, you know, Aleppo had a lot of trade relations with Italy um, back in this 18th, 19th century. The De Pachotos were a Jewish banking family from Italy um, that had established a sort of branch or, uh, in Aleppo. And so if you see the name De Pachoto, it's typically a, a Syrian Jew, but they, they also went to Beirut um, and were working in banking in Beirut and all, in Geneva as well. Right. And right. Um, um, David Tawil, could you explain to your father how to unmute and then we will get your father on the call. Okay. And um, meanwhile, um, Vendetta is apparently a great read um, about the whole scandal to do with American Express. Yeah, I see. I, I see a question, but I just want, like, you know, I know we have probably a, a pretty good concentration of people from the, the UK and, and England. Um, and, you know, London was one of his, you know, he literally lived in six or seven places. He often had a town, and there was a very, it was a obviously a banking center. One of the interesting things I found, you know, in, in 1972, when TDB uh, went public, it was the biggest public offering on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, since World War II, raised about 16 million pounds. And the diamonds, he was like, who's gonna do the underwriting? And he's writing his friends, he's like, you know, keep, keep these Ashkenazi banks away from me, they're gonna kill me. P.S. it was led by N.M. Rothschild with Jacob Rothschild as the lead banker. And at the press conference, um, he stood up and said, Jacob, that is, you know, we've known you for a while. My father knew your father. Um, our grandfathers knew your grandfathers. Uh, they were connected in, in mostly through the trading of gold. Uh, the Safras were connected with the Mokadas and the Rothschilds. And again, I found correspondence dating from the 40s, 50s uh, in trading of uh, gold, silver um, between the uh, families. Uh, and uh, what's fortunate, Jacob Rothschild, we, we did an event uh, at Summer, Somerset House in October. Um, and uh, part of the event was Jacob, I was interviewing Jacob Rothschild on a, on a video because he was too ill to come down to London with his memories of working with Edmund Safra, not only on that public offering, but they also invested uh, in art together in the 1970s and worked on many uh, philanthropic endeavors together. Okay, uh, Moise, can you unmute yourself? So while he's unmuting, uh, just read out Amalia's comment. Uh, one of her friends was one of his personal nurses. And one of her favorite stories is how he sneaked into the kitchen at night for dessert. And <laughs> made her promise not to tell Lily. 
<laughs> oh, that's right. wonderful. I think Moise is having a problem. Um, I can, can ask your son David to tell him how to do it. I'll remove the spotlight and as soon as he can yeah. do it, we will put him on. Yeah, there's a, a question from uh, Yitzchak about asking if they had dealings with um, the Reconadis, um, which brings to mind a point I made about Israel. I, I, I said at the beginning that he explicitly avoided doing business in Israel because they didn't. They were doing a lot of business with Kuwait. They had the bank in Lebanon. He was worried about the Jews in Syria. He was not in the 50s and 60s explicitly identifying with Israel, even though he was supporting um, organizations like Parat Yosef, the tomb of Meir Bal Hanes up by Tiberias, they gave a lot of money to. Uh, that starts to change. In the 70s, his rabbi from Beirut, Rabbi Atiyah, leaves and winds up in, in Bat Yam. And there's correspondence uh, from the late 70s where you know, he wants to build a synagogue in uh, Israel for Lebanese Jews and Edmund essentially funded it himself down to like telling him, oh, you're spending too much on the air conditioning. Um, it's, it's too much on the construction. And he comes to Israel in 1981 for the first time uh, under uh, like staying at a hotel under an assumed name. Over the course of the 80s, he comes back in public um, with his brothers, with family members for bar mitzvahs. He becomes friends with uh, the prime ministers, Teddy Kollek of Jerusalem. And in 1991, the Safras bought um, First International Bank of Israel, Phoebe, F-I-B-I. Uh, that was their sort of first investment in a financial institution uh, in Israel. Okay, now. That's wonderful. Can we have Moise? Moise, can you unmute yourself? Your son David says you know how to do it now. If you can, it'd be great. I'm asking to unmute. Oops. I wonder the technology. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. I think too, I can, uh, while you're working, I can address one more question. Someone asked about his, his brothers. Yes. So he had three brothers. Ellie Safra was the oldest. Um, he essentially left the family business in 1948. There's a document where he's sort of bought out of the family business, but he lived in Geneva the rest of his life and continued to work with Edmund. His two younger brothers, Moise and Joseph, who Edmund sort of helped set up in business in Beirut. And their sort of, let's say unofficial agreement was you guys take uh, Brazil, I'll take the rest of the world. Although that his banks did business in Brazil and, and the brothers banks did uh, business throughout the world. Um, they built up Banco Safra into a very large institution. At a certain point, Moise and Joseph uh, sort of separate uh, their businesses uh, Moise died in 2014, and Joseph just died, um, I think, at the end of 2020. And so his bank, which he has left to his children, uh, you know, at the time of his death, um, the newspapers were saying that Joseph was worth about $20 billion, largely on the strength of the of the bank that he had built up in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you just say one last thing about synagogues, far-flung synagogues in the world? I, I believe there's one in Kinshasa. One in St. Petersburg, somebody else. So that. he funded a lot of synagogues in his lifetime, um, but never in his own name. So if you see a synagogue that is in, in Brazil or in Israel that was Beit Yaakov, Ohel Yaakov, that was named after his father. In the early 70s in Spain, they're building the first synagogue since the Inquisition. Rabbi Garzon comes to him and he gives a lot of money and it's called Beit Yaakov. He did donate money in his lifetime to the Coral Synagogue in St. Petersburg. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes was he had been in the island of Rhodes in the summer. He liked to yacht around the Mediterranean and he needed to say Kaddish. He went, there's a very small synagogue there. As you know, that community was decimated in the Holocaust. And he would send a check for $500 every year to have a Kazan go to do high holiday services. Um, in the years since his death, so he left most of his fortune to his foundation uh, under the direction of Lily Safra and several professionals, um, they have built probably a dozen Edmund Safra synagogues. There's one in Aventura, Florida. There's one in New York, right around the corner from where he used to live called the Edmund J. Safra synagogue. Um, there's one in Deal, and there are several Edmund Safra synagogues uh, in Israel. Fantastic. 
wonderful what a man what a man what a legacy so i Indeed. think we'll probably come to the end of the questions here uh and um gosh we could go on forever with uh, reminiscences and um little anecdotes so um i don't want to keep you from your day job <laughs> daniel uh but as is our custom we usually close the meeting by unmuting everybody so they can just we can have a free-for-all well not quite a free-for-all <laughs> they should raise their hand and we'll try and yeah, let them go by, yeah. one by one but that's we, right we, we do unmute uh, and i just want to tell everybody um please do come and join us for our next uh program which will be about the fate of Jewish converts to Islam. And for, for that, we go to Professor Fenton, who will be talking mainly about Morocco. Um, and um, I, it remains to me to thank Daniel so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and again, if you want to buy the book, it's on Amazon and other good books, bookstores um and uh well worth reading thank you very much right, and thank you up. all uh we just have our commercial break and then you'll all be able to say something <laughs> well, like I said, first of all thank you so much for inviting me um i'm not sure who it was well, I, we did this event in london and somebody came up afterwards and introduced themselves as being yes, that, that was our harif, our harif uh nick um, his name is Ralph. Ralph. So thank you to Ralph for introducing us. Uh, and and, um, and it's been an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you. And Daniel, well, we'd hope to see you in London. No excuses. You're around. The, you're coming to your son around the corner from us. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and I should. I'm not sure how to post it, but if there's anybody who wants to be in touch with me, my email is grossdaniel11 at yahoo.com if Lynn, if you want to post that in the in a yeah. chat that everybody can see um i'm happy to hear from from yeah. uh from people uh, i appreciate everybody's uh interest and uh you know a group yeah. like this i don't have to do a sales job of you know why you should be interested in, in this man's life and his legacy no, so i really no, appreciate please. you all i'm just wondering if your email address has some um uh yeah, I don't know. Super no, there's there's no there's no numerical <laughs> meaning. It's just uh... <laughs> okay. Well, if if um, sorry, I think uh, have you have you sorry? Can you just repeat your your email address or or just yeah. everybody write to me at info at harif .org yeah. and I'll pass on Daniel's. Yeah, email. it's it's uh, it's gross Daniel one one at Yahoo. Can you write it down. Okay. Beyond, beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Don't say that. Okay, uh, we've had all the adverts in the background. I think the next talk, Lynn, is... So the next talk is on the 14th of February, and that's uh, about Jewish converts to Islam and what was their fate. <laughs> Great, and we hope to see everyone there. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And now, whoever, if you want to raise your hand, if you want to speak, let's do it that way. And we'll go around whoever wants to speak. So I think it's Holly wants to go first. Hi, Daniel. This is Holly Rosenberg from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for your presentation. They sure don't do banking like they like they used to, huh? No, and, they sure uh, don't. And I enjoy you looking at your uh, duck above your uh, <laughs> bookcase. And thank you, Lawrence and uh, Lynn, as always. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> Great. Does anyone else want to say hello? Or is it all stunned into silence and wondering when they're going to have to repay their loan. <laughs> Great. So I think everyone's stunned into silence. Great. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now and uh...